Okay, so Warner Brothers flew out myself and a whole bunch of uh, comic book influence, really like YouTube influencers, like YouTubers, um, people on the DC Universe app who are like moderators, like all these people who were involved in like the DC Universe app and who are influencers on social media and the comic book industry and, and you know, really the gaming industry to a degree. Uh, Warner Brothers flew us all out to LA and we got to spend the weekend checking out this whole DC Universe event that they have going on, which is really showcasing like where it's at now, which like the DC Universe, like it's, well, they're also showcasing things they have later on, um, but they're, there, there's something that I can that I cannot talk about. Um, you kind of have to sign up for the DC Universe app to find out, but I promise they're worth it. <laughs> the DC Universe app is beast. Um, it, it's like it's like this one stop shop for DC, right? So like you have Marvel Unlimited, but it's just like comic books, and even then, like the organization is pretty tough. But with DC Universe, like it's organized, it's categorized. Like you've got you've got like everything related to DC. So you got TV shows, you have like like you know comics. You've got you got you've actually got comic books. You can look up a character and then find all the comics. That's associated with that character so it makes reading order super simple um but there's also a promo code down in the uh, in the description of this video now the promo code only works until april 1st so make sure you guys like sign up for it as soon as you can uh but the promo code will get you 20 percent off the annual pass right so it's not monthly it's not the monthly pass it's just 20 dollars for the annual or 20 percent off for the annual pass but it's worth it so you guys should you guys should definitely go you guys should definitely get it because i mean it's i mean i've got it <laughs> it's pretty legit okay so picking up with heroes in crisis part six like a lot of the a lot of the story that we've seen so far is kind of split into sections and so we're going to kind of take each one of these because what it does is it actually sort of bounces back and forth between a guy named narc and then holly quinn and then wally west so we're going to kind of take these in segments but with harley quinn like like hers is really the most straightforward because what's ironic about this is that with sanctuary poison ivy had shown up here presumably for the sake of like getting help but for the most part poison ivy's just kind of like i'm fine the way i am this is really more for harley quinn so it's really more that like she snuck harley quinn in there which is kind of a bad guy doing what a bad guy does i guess but and the gist behind this really seems to be more towards kind of leaning towards the idea that there really kind of appear to be some criminals out there who are just incorrigible and that the indication seems to be that harley quinn was perceived as being one of those criminals that there was really no way to help her there was no way to make her better but the cool thing about this is that tom king kind of hits on the idea that she's not that far gone what she needed was the right kind of treatment and the way this seems to kind of come about is when poison ivy starts helping harley quinn by basically creating like these manifestations of the joker and what they do is go through and essentially like torment the joker and kill him destroy him that kind of different thing because that's what the joker did to harley quinn and that's one of the things to bear in mind here is that a lot of those themes that weren't necessarily hit on you know that, that were really hit on on the nose in batman the animated series certainly were in the comics that the joker was exceedingly abusive but harley quinn kept coming back due to some warped perspective of what love is supposed to be now how you know how harley quinn got to that point is really kind of reflective of whatever her origin story is right i mean she's got one origin story in batman the animated series she's got another origin story in the actual dc comics and then she's got another origin story when she was rebooted in the new 52 but throughout all of those the common themes are basically that harley quinn in some form or fashion was kind of brought up with a, with a victim's mentality with kind of like an abusive mentality so it's, it's kind of strange the way it all plays out but again it, it sort of makes sense with her character in terms of how she's progressed so far so like literally poison ivy's using her her vines to like kill the joker like the joker's like killing himself basically like cutting his own throat is basically using these things as a means to kind of help harley get past the kind of pain that she's experienced and stop seeing the joker as someone that could legitimately torment her and see the Joker as somebody who's just easily killed because in a lot of ways the Joker is the Joker is really like an easily killable guy the story of Harley Quinn kind of ends when the alarm bells go off basically saying like you know there's an emergency you guys all need to make their way to the exit because Harley's not supposed to be there Poison Ivy tells her stay here I'm gonna go see what's going on and then of course as we know Poison Ivy dies and so what we end up doing at this point is we switch over to to Wally West now for Wally West it's kind of interesting here because the big torment of Wally isn't necessarily like any sort of scenario he's been put through as a hero with regards to like a villain he face it took like an emotional toll or anything like that it's being cut off from the world like that's the torment of wally west that when everything happened with flashpoint and the characters were effectively rebooted wally west was stuck in the speed force so when barry allen came out when the whole reboot finished barry allen had like his whole life and he was so sure of the life he lived being the right one with like donna troy and dick grayson and all those characters living their lives they've effectively lived their lives the way they're supposed to wally west is suddenly being thrown in here and because of the fact that like this this huge event of flashpoint happened and nobody remembers what happened before the events of flashpoint Wally's mindset being he's one of the few who does remember is like things aren't the way they're supposed to be he does he's not married to his wife he's not married to Linda Park he can't find Jai and Iris his kids so in his mind like the world's literally in shambles and for a brief moment when Barry Allen basically realized who he was and Barry Allen brought him back it was kind of like hey like everything's going to go back to the way it was supposed to only for us to find out that it's not now it's kind of interesting the, the way the way Tom King does this because in reality Tom King doesn't really do anything to change the nature of Wally West what he does is he uses the story to frame the 
perspective of Wally West in a slightly different way, that it really is just kind of a crushing situation, that there's no going back, that that's kind of the fear and, and really the basis behind Wally West's life right now. He can't go back to the way things used to be. And that's kind of the cool thing about the, the Heroes in Crisis story and the nature of Wally is because when Superman embraces him and says, hey man, like you're back. And when Nightwing embraces him and Donna Troy embraces him and, and Roy Harper embraces him, they keep saying like, you're back, man. You're the embodiment of hope. But the question that, that Wally has is, how could I be the embodiment of hope if I'm hopeless? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the cool scenario here is things change. The world moves forward. You've got to change with the times. And so it's kind of a cool little thing because when of course all that begins to go down, when all that begins to happen, basically like Wally, despite the, despite the fact that he's, he's basically surrounded by the Titans, despite the fact that Superman knows who he is because Superman knows how things were before the events of Flashpoint, despite the fact that he's surrounded by like Barry Allen, Iris West, these people that essentially know who he is, it doesn't change the fact that Wally West in his entirety feels completely alone. He feels completely alone and cut off because from his perspective, he's in a world that he doesn't belong in. And so that's what makes it kind of crazy. So again, it's, it's really interesting because again, like the alarm bells go off and then it all kind of comes to a head. Now again, we'll, we'll get to that point here in a second in terms of what comes next. But at this point, we jump back to a character named Nark. Now, Nark was a character who originally appeared back in 1971 by Steve Skeets, I think it was, the, the guy who created him. Uh, but essentially, he's like an old school pre-crisis character. But essentially, like this version of his character is kind of reminiscing on how things were back in the in the early days of his life. And in the early days of, of Nark's life, he was just like a Neanderthal, right? Like he was a caveman, essentially. And what had happened was that a meteorite had struck the Earth and then a fraction of that meteorite, some of the crystal composed inside, bonded itself to him and basically like jump-started his, his intellect, made him super smart. When that happened, of course, eventually he was frozen in ice. And then basically he was stuck there for like hundreds and thousands of, of years until he was eventually discovered by like the Teen Titans. Being discovered by the Teen Titans, he was essentially let loose and then like kind of joined the team for a little while and then his fate was never really specified. Now in the New 52, we ended up learning like that there was like a new version of him. But again, none of that really ties into like how his character quote unquote died according to Lilith in the uh, in the pre-Flashpoint landscape. But again, at this moment right now, because of the fact that he's so intelligent, he reminisces on characters like Hobbes and uh, and Rousseau. Now Hobbes is uh, is basically talking about Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes was this philosopher that had this really, really dark perspective, right? Like he, he considered the nature of humanity to be a perpetual and permanent war of all against all. You had something called a state of nature. There was no ordered government. It was just kind of humans, really more of like what passes for nomadic tribes, just kind of making their way. But it's essentially a state of nature, no ordered government of any kind. Thomas Hobbes believed that because resources are finite, that resources basically have to be preserved. But the only way to really preserve those resources is to create what was called the Leviathan, which is essentially like an order government created by whatever society exists at the time. And so again, like there are a lot of other themes that go into it in terms of like abuses of power. If a king abuses his powers, it's just the way it goes. There's really not a whole lot you can do about that. I mean, you can try to overthrow the king, but a new one will take his place and then he may be just abusive as well. It's the price you pay to main maintain some kind of like order and structure in society that you can't have at all. But again, Thomas Hobbes was very dark and, and very, very bleak. But at the same time, when Nark is kind of talking about his life, he says there was a lot of freedom back then. Like in the early days of his life, there was a lot of freedom that a man really just kind of lived by the sweat of his brow. That's all it was. You know, that he basically he fought with nature in order to kind of maintain his role among nature itself. You know, and that's when he kind of begins to go into Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a philosopher who compared the modern day to the, the, the state of nature and basically said state of nature was better because people had actual freedom. That there really is no freedom right now. There's freedom insofar as your ability to make decisions, but your ability to make decisions is predicated based on like societal structures, right? So like I'm going to tweet, but I have to make sure I don't tweet the wrong thing. Otherwise I could lose my job 10 years later. I mean, it's, it's that kind of, it's not really freedom per se. You can't say anything you want to. You can't do anything you want to. You're limited by like the rules of society, by the scope of the society that you live in. And that's really kind of what, it, what, what Mark hits at is he had absolute freedom back then. That the only real rules of society, the only real rules of the world he lived in was survival of the fittest. That he needs to eat, but another Neanderthal needs to eat. And so where he tracks down the kill, another Neanderthal will run up on him and try to take it. And basically whoever's the strongest kills the other and then gets to feast on the on the, on the the animal they killed. That was the rule of nature. It was the, the, the law of the land. Those who are strong enough to survive are the only ones who deserve to survive. So again, it was it's, it's, it's a little bit darker, but again, like there's a lot of a lot of themes of freedom that go in there. And it's kind of interesting when you look at it that way, because Nark kind of has a point that like back in his early days, it really was just freedom. He was free to do whatever he wanted to, to, to live his life however he wanted to. There were no bounds there. There were no limits there. The only limits imposed on him were the physical limits of his body at that point in time, the limits of where he could travel in terms of what's too cold, what's too hot, and the limits in terms of what his mind could comprehend. And that was it. Everything else, he could do whatever he wanted to. And imagine that kind of freedom. Imagine the freedom to go where you want, when you want, how you want to say anything you want to. Like, imagine that kind of freedom. And 
then compare that to the modern day and look how free you're really not. That was kind of the argument of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You're not really as free as you believe. You're as free as you've been told. And so it's it's, it's really kind of a, a cool comparison between these, these two different philosophies. But again, like, you know, the alarm bells go off. Mark ends up making his way off and basically says, hey, look, maybe I'm kind of overthinking it all. But at the same time, like, that's when everything kind of begins to unfold. Again, when, like, all these different superheroes end up getting killed on the grounds of Sanctuary. And so that's when we basically end up finding out Booster Gold was the one who killed Wally West. And presumably Booster Gold was the one who killed everybody else. That seems to be the case here. And so it's, it's kind of interesting because what it, what it sort of hits at is that when Harley Quinn had shown up there with a blood splattered mallet, that mallet was actually her like smashing the Joker. At least it seems to be that she was killing the various duplicates of the Joker that were being made in Sanctuary as a way to basically heal her wounds. She wasn't actually going through and killing superheroes. The actual killer here seems to be Booster Gold. So again, it's pretty interesting. And, it, and it's really, I really like the direction that it's taking in terms of how the story is unfolding. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.